Welcome back to the Athlete Hackers podcast. My name is Chris Schrade. And my name is Mark Spellman. We have two incredible individuals and coaches that are going to be joining us. But first, let's go over our last uh, episode with Brandon Lilly. Uh, for those that chimed in or, or heard it, they're probably getting ready to listen about the cube method and his training philosophies and how he has gotten to where he is as far as his professional and personal life. But it went kind of off the rails, which I was happy about and talked about a lot of other things. My main takeaway, and he's not the only one that's uh, stated this, uh, it's about the importance of your tribe and the people in your tribe and how you need to keep your tribe tight and you need to keep expanding and getting out of your comfort zone to be the best version of yourself. Yeah, uh, for me, I think uh, just listening to his story and kind of putting the pieces together, it, it sounds like at some point he had some kind of enlightenment. And the man he is today <clears throat> is completely different uh, than he was when he was doing powerlifting, um, probably for the better of society. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But the, uh, the other interesting part is his transition into jiu-jitsu. So if you want to hear about that, go listen to the podcast. The, the other thing I'll touch on is that if you in five years look back at the person that you are today and you haven't changed, then shame on you. I mean, and, 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 and he, he, really, he really dove deep into his transformation <clears throat> from where he was as a, the number one uh, power lifter in the world to where he is today so that was pretty awesome yeah without further ado we're breaking we're breaking ground here today on athlete hackers and it is our first time with two that's right two, two guests and it is my pleasure to introduce these two gentlemen that i've had the pleasure for knowing for about about a year maybe two years i knew about them peripheral uh following them on instagram but i've i've gotten to know them a little better over the last uh, course of the year, going through continuing education courses, some seminars, some stuff online. Uh, it is my my it is my pleasure to introduce Coach Ray and Coach TK. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Thank uh, you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Coach. Coaches, coaches. <laughs> I'm so used to saying Coach. Thanks yeah, for coming on. Go you got to go plural today. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, because of the way that this came about, uh, Coach Ray, let's start with you. <clears throat> let's go over how you got down there to be the director of men's basketball strength and conditioning at William & Mary. Are, are we calling it strength and conditioning still, or is it sports performance, or is it basketball performance, or is it <laughs> athletic performance? Right, right. My title is director of men's basketball performance. Okay. But I've been in the business <laughs> long enough where – uh, I've had many titles, so there's been a transformation in terms of titles and responsibilities. So yep. um, I like to be called, you know, strength and conditioning coach, but it is what it is. <laughs> so, you know, briefly on my journey, I came into the profession around 2002, 2003, backgrounds in exercise physiology, human movement. So my first experience in the profession was working at Holy Cross College, uh, working with a coach by the name of Jeff Oliver, who has put out a tremendous amount of strength coaches into the profession. Great individual, great coach. And then my first full-time assignment was at Northeastern University. And my team assignments were men and women's basketball at the time. From there, I was fortunate enough to move on to University of Akron, where I also trained men and women's basketball, was there for about four years. Had an opportunity to work at the University of Wisconsin, originally with women's basketball, was there for about 10 years. Late in my tenure, was able to transition to men's basketball, working with a coach by the name of Eric Helen. And Eric came from the Chicago Bulls, uh, has been with the Chicago organization for a very long time, was hired by Al Vermeil to work with the team that um, featured, you know, the Michael Jordans and the Scottie Pippins and what have you. 
And then from there, left University of Wisconsin, went to massage school, manual therapy school, and then was able to get back into the profession here at William & Mary, was hired by Eric Corm, who at the time when he was here, uh, created, and we could talk about it, this high performance model, but I was able to come in and work under his guidance. And that briefly has been my journey. So work mostly with men and women's basketball, have trained other sports, have trained volleyball, have worked with football, have trained baseball, what have you. And, you know, we talked about some of the things that are wrong with the profession, quote unquote. I don't think there's not enough young practitioners that are getting their hands dirty with multiple teams, multiple sports. <laughs> it seems like young practitioners are coming into the gaming wanted to, wanting to specialize and work with a, a, a specific team or a certain team. Well, we can talk about that, you know, throughout the podcast, throughout the podcast. But that's been my, you know, journey, you know, briefly in a nutshell. Okay. Mm -hmm. TK, you got, you got you, you, Coach Ray dragged you in, in on this. On this today, so. First of all, first of all, thank you, Ray, for bringing in TK. But TK, what you got going on? Uh, yeah, so I'm here at. I think my titles, I'm not sure my title. I'm pretty sure the last time I looked at it is like head, head of sports performance for men's basketball. As well as, for me, it's always with titles. I'm, like, I'm not worried about the title. I'm always more worried about the responsibility. Um, <laughs> but I'll say early, I see I started coaching in 2014, 2014, 2013. Um, I was still doing my undergrad. So I started, I played basketball at D2 school called Mississippi College, and I transferred to Arkansas State. Uh, where I started back like playing rugby. Then while I was playing rugby there, I started like coaching as well. And I actually got a, so because I knew I wanted to be a transition coach early on, like during my college and bachelor's, so I went and got a personal training certification. So I think I, I, think I got like, like an NASM or ACSM, one of those. You can get it with just like a high school diploma. And so I knew like, okay, I need to, I need to coach. I need to get reps coaching. And so I was worked at like the rec center on campus and worked at like a little gym in town. I was just like a personal trainer for like people would like a lot mostly pretty much entirely gym pop a few like youth like athletes whatever like local schools but basically basically just gym pop um intern at Arkansas State as the first internship and then um at that time I was like running our strength conditioning program for rugby then like went over to Japan for summer um a little over three months with the professional rugby team there, came back to the state, finished my undergrad, still like getting as many reps coaching where I can as far as like personal training. Popped over to England. I was in England for two years, living in London, working in rugby and fighting as the two main spots. And they had some other like private clients that were like tennis players and uh, basketball players. Back to the US, when I was working for the Astros for a little over two years. Um, my were, you stealing, first were you year. stealing signs? <laughs> got there after, got there the year after. <laughs> <laughs> Missed out in the World Series ring. Oh, <laughs> um, sorry to hear that. <laughs> then I, then while I was so in Dublin my first year in the minor league system, just like just just grinding out on night on fifteen hour bus rides in the Texas League. Um, then was head of rehab my second year there. Um, there's kind of that oversaw our rehab from our major league team all the way down to our our Dominican team, our Dominican development team down the DR, and it's and anybody in between there. So any so my range sometimes would be like a 16 year old kid who English is his, he speaks Spanish, English is a second language to the 10 year vet basically it was like the bandwidth of possible people <laughs> we could have. And then from there was at. Uh, Kansas City uh, NWSL team, so professional women's soccer league. Was there for seven, eight months before I got fired. I was head of performance there, and then now I'm here. There's the one takeaway I've got from doing this podcast with all you strength coaches is that if you want to see the country or the world, become a strength coach. If you want to stay in one place, don't become a strength coach. Oh. Well, you, you look at the, the, the individuals that have been at one place for a long time and a long time in our profession is any, I'd say anything over five years. 
to be at one place. I mean, I was at, I was at a school for 12, you know, and, and anything, whenever you have two numbers as <laughs> you've been at one place, like that's, un, that's almost unheard of. So, yeah. and that's one of the things that I think really needs to change in the profession, but we'll get into that. I think for the people that are listening, and I think both coaches touched on it, um, especially for young coaches, I don't even say older coaches, you got to get reps in, you got to coach, yeah, hundreds, hundreds, you know, yeah. I mean, all the theory, all the book stuff, all the foundational stuff on sets and reps and, you know, are you going to be a ground base? Are you going to be a uh, Olympic lift? Are you going to be a high intensity guy? you know, or, or, or girl, I mean, you know, once again, and, I, and this came to me later in my profession, you got to meet the athletes where you're at, where they're at, and you got to help them get better. However, whatever the mode is, I mean, you might, you might need to, two or three people on your team might have to do some Olympic lifts. They need to get more ballistic. Some people might need to, you know, get some more cardio, their, their aerobic base sucks. They got to be able to, you know, when the time calls, they still got to be able to run up and down the court for 20 minutes and get after it. Uh, and they might have to do some more cardio. But our job is to meet them where they're at, not them meet us where we're at. I mean, and, that, and then for young coaches, you know, they get so they get so involved and silo themselves on one style of training methodology yep. that they lose the other things that actually could actually help their student athletes. And Chris has heard me say this before. The answer is four. Some of us, it's going to be two plus two. Others, it's going to be the square root of 16. The other people, it's going to be four, uh, eight minus four. We're all going to get to four. Sure. But some people are going to take different paths there. And I think, and, and, and you guys can agree or disagree with me on this, but I think a lot of people in our profession see a snippet of what we do in our facilities with our athletes and they don't see the bigger picture, yeah. you know? And I think with social media nowadays, you have all these coaches that are Snapchatting, Instagramming, you know, what their kids are doing. And everybody thinks that's the only thing that these coaches and athletes are doing, but that's only like 1% of what they're doing, you know? And, and that's where, that's why I, I think social media can be very good for our profession, but at the same time, you better you better be very careful on what you're putting out there, especially if you're a young coach. I mean, an older coach. I I mean, I'll put something on Instagram, and if, if you don't like it, just delete it. I don't. I could care less. But um, you know, as as two gentlemen that have been in the profession for a while, uh, I think the first question I want to. I want to get into as we're getting into basketball season here in about two weeks, I believe. Uh, what's the first thing that you're looking at as a freshman athlete comes into your facility? What are the, what are the things that you, 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 you want to see? What are the things that you're going to try and develop and work on? And then how, how are you working with them in that, uh, you know, three to four year process that these young men are going to be with you? I'll go ahead start on this one TK. <laughs> PK and I talk about this all the time. So one thing I've learned about the profession is, and TK touched on this, it's not necessarily the title, but the responsibility. I'm at this stage in my career, what's my responsibility? What's my task? And how are you going to support that responsibility and support me achieving the task? And what we don't talk about in our profession and TKI talk about this all the time is what's our interaction with sport coaches? Yeah. What's our interaction with yeah. a silo that really doesn't understand what our responsibility is, really can't define what our job is. But at the end of the day, we have to support these coaches and support these players to achieve a task or I'm sorry, to achieve an outcome that is to win games. So it's really important for practitioners, sport practitioners, even young practitioners to develop the art of being able to communicate to a coach about what is needed, about your responsibility, and not be afraid to share information because of some type of blowback. Because if our job is supposed to prepare for athletes to play sport and do so in a manner that doesn't get them hurt, 
we have to be able to communicate with an area in which the players spend the majority of their time. So when you talk about basketball, 75, 80% of their time is spent in sport, is spent working with the sport coach. 25% of it is really spent with the physical preparatory coach, okay? So when it comes to young athletes, one thing I've noticed with basketball athletes, and we can, I think we can all agree to this is, yeah, they may have mastered their sport, but their exposure to training is almost non-existent. We're talking about athletes that have a training age, not zero, negative one, right? We're talking about athletes that haven't mastered what it takes or haven't mastered the understanding of what training is, right? So it's a process. I always say that our job is to slow cook the athlete and not microwave the athlete. So the, the first year is like teaching the athlete how to train. Once they've learned how to train, now you train to train, then you train to compete, and then you train to win. I think you, I think you put a post up about this this week. Mm. I, I probably did. <laughs> no, I didn't. You definitely <laughs> did, because I liked it. And I emoji the hell out of it, as I always do. <laughs> so that's what I see is, you know, you have to understand a couple of things. You have to understand the pressure that sport coaches are under in their job, and you have to respect that, okay? And then you also have to understand that when a young athlete comes into a college environment, we always talk about preparation and development, but sometimes, most of the times, that's not the case. What I'm seeing is young athletes that are being optimized quickly, right? We, we work in a business where we need results and we need results yesterday. So for me, when I'm working with young athletes, okay, and they're working with the coaches, it's trying to sit down with the coaches to understand what are we trying to accomplish here, okay? You know, if you're taking a young athlete that may be skilled in their sport, but there's some physical capacities that need to be worked on to underpin their ability to play their sport, Okay, and the coach needs that athlete to win games. What does that dynamic looks like? And how can we all come together? This is the high performance model. How can we all come together to achieve the results of being successful in sport, the athlete getting the physical requirements necessary to play their sport, and we're doing so without putting the athlete in any danger, any harm, okay? Because the role, our role, as sport coaches, sport practitioners, sports medicine, what have you, is to create the most adaptable athlete on and off the field, ice, pool, what have you. So how do we create that environment? So I know you're probably looking for a more concrete answer when it comes to training young people, okay. but I think it starts with having communication with the sport coaches that you're working with and understanding what that dynamic is going to look like first and foremost and tk and i talk about this all the time there are some colleagues that we know good coaches friends of ours that you know they come to us and ask us how do i communicate to this particular coach that their practices are monotonous or that the intensities of their practices are just way too high that the guys or the young ladies need to recover how do i communicate that and my thoughts are what are you talking about like you should be able to have that conversation with your coaches. And if you can't have that conversation with your coaches, then something is wrong with that dynamic. Let's yeah. forget about the athlete. Something is 100%. wrong between the dynamic between yourself and the coach because you all are there to serve the athlete. So for me, and, that, and so that's uh, something I want to tell young coaches out there is you need reps in the weight room, but you also need reps in terms of how do you communicate with the coaches that you're going to support. And that's just not sport coaches. We're talking about sports medicine. We're talking about academics. We're talking about all these silos that's going to have an impact on you being able to fulfill your job. But also, also remember that relationship with the administration as well. And in, in, in right. relationship with the admin who may oversee the sport, what have you. There's because so many variables that impacts our ability to deliver, uh, you know, what we're being responsible to do. Well, and, and as... 
as I as I had to deal with my my one of my sport coaches was very easily going to the sport admin and complaining about what I was doing in the weight room. But he, he never came to me. I mean, when, when they came to me, it was the sport coach, the AD and I sitting down and me basically getting ganged up on because of their relationship and not and my and my failure on my part to not have a better relationship with that sport coach and that administrator before it came those those two coming at me over a perception that the head coach had really didn't know because they never came to the weight room but at the same time I wasn't as clear as I needed to be with that interaction of okay coach you want this your assistant coaches are seeing this and they're communicating to you on what they think is going on in the weight room but you need to come down and see what actually is going on in the weight room you know and and that was a failure on my part and it led to me getting fired so we had uh we had jesse Wright on who was a uh, former strength and conditioning coach for the 76ers a couple podcasts ago and his big thing right now is 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 preaching about soft skills right and i think what, you, what you're saying coach is that some of these young guys that are coming in that's one of the things they got to pick up on, you know, if, and, and it's not an easy thing because you're dealing with a lot of different personalities. You're dealing with big egos when it comes to, you know, sports coaches and, you know, they've got their own job to protect, you know, so how, how do you approach someone the right way, you know, to go that, to, to, to talk about these things and, you know, make sure that you're doing right by the athletes. Um, it's, it's the, the, the objective in college athletics, right, or the objective of sports, and I'll let TK talk about this, since this is a show, a podcast of honesty, the objective in college athletics is to win. That's the objective, okay? I'm brought here to William Mary to help men's basketball win and win big, win championships, get into, you know, the NCAA, and the same thing with TK at UMass. So, the objective is to win. So how do we achieve those objectives, right? So how do um, sport coaches, uh, sports practitioners, uh, uh, sports medicine, academics, like how do we all work together to kind of achieve those objectives, right? And then once you figure out, you know, what that looks like, then you have a plan of intervention, okay? That you say, okay, this is how we're going to go about and uh, achieve uh, the, the task at hand. But I, my, I think my success here at William & Mary thus far has been Coach Fisher. We talked about this, TK. He trusts me, <laughs> right? He trusts me because I'm always, I'm available. I'm open-minded. Uh, I challenge him respectfully, professionally, and he does vice versa. Um, he's seen the results that come from that interaction. Okay. And because of it, um, we just have a good relationship, a good working relationship. And that trickles down to the assistants. It trickles down to the players. Now you start getting compliance uh, from the players. And now everybody's kind of on the, now everyone's kind of on the same page on achieving the goal, which is winning games. That's just my opinion. So yeah, I think soft skills are, are very important in our profession. I, I'm gonna let TK, TK, I'm gonna let you talk. We talk about this all the time, TK. Before, before any young coach goes out and blasts their head sport coach in an open forum and calls them out and gets fired about five minutes after they do it, I'm, assu I'm assuming, Ray, you challenge your head coach and he challenges you in probably a, a closed forum, not in front of the, not in front of the players. Exactly. I mean, that's one thing we don't do is when we do have discussion, obviously it's with myself, coach, our athletic trainer, all the assistants, what have you. We may even have someone, you know, academics, but I mean, coach, uh, he created this type of culture and it's what he wants. And he, and he feels like this is what's going to make us successful. You know what I mean? But, um, I think, you know, once again, it's once again, now I, I pick and choose when, you know, if, if I see something that's problematic, I'm going to pick and choose when I go talk to coach about, you know, things that, you know, we may need to have discussion on. 
right? So there's an art in that communication as well. You see what I'm saying? But oh, yeah. that comes with, for me, it came over time, um, you know, interacting not only with just basketball coaches, but with multiple coaches, working with lots of athletes, making a lot of mistakes. You see what I'm saying? Um, so, uh, yeah, <laughs> there you have it. TK, what, I Let's mean, see. cause you're, you just, you told us you've been at UMass for about two, two to three months right now. Mm. Um, and that's a, that's a hard, that's a hard time to come in right now. I mean, summer's over guys, yeah. guys were working, guys were working with another coach. Um, philosophically, you might, you might be a, a lot different. You might be similar, but you know, how, how have the last two to three months been up at UMass and, and, and talk on what Ray was talking about the relationship coming into a new situation. Mm. I'll say a big one. For me, I mean, the last two, three months have been great as far as I work with my staff, work with the head coach, um, all the assistants. Uh, for me, I think some of my learned, I don't remember if I stole some someone or if it's like an idea, I kind of came up like a book or something. But the way like I always go about those initial conversations with the coach to talk about, you know, practice and practice planning and periodization and things like that, as I always come from the framework of like, I mean, one of the first questions I asked him was, what's been the thing that's hindered success in your four years here? And then most of the time they'll give you they give you the answer. Oh, we haven't been fit enough, or we've been physically unmatched, or in our case here it was it was injuries. We don't want like healthy. That like our our coaching staff was adamant like healthy. We're a top three, top four team in the A10. Not healthy. We're middle of the pack. And so they've struggled within with injuries because we not we're not going to be a 12, 13 team, 13 player to deep team. We're going to be seven to eight players are going to play most nights so it's like how we keep those guys who are playing tons of minutes in practice like healthy and then so me coming from that kind of standpoint of like what's how can I help you fix the issues that you that you've had since being here oh another issue is oh accountability and and culture and things like that it's okay well I'm pretty I'm big on having, like, not having I've not been on having rules and been on having like standards and expectations and like holding everyone accountable to those. So like coming with that, of like, oh, this is what's kind of how I operate. I don't accept, you know, people being late and things and things and things like that. So it's like having it's almost like providing, asking the questions that, that they, that they, that they tell they give you the answer in a way. Like, okay, what's my biggest in this performance? Oh, injuries, not being fit enough, things like that. Oh, okay, well, here's a plan. Well, here's an idea that we can try. And we can kind of like undulate our, our practices so they're not monotonous. We can have our high days and low days and medium days and higher volume, higher intensity. Oh, we have this thing called catapult that just had it for three or four years. It's how we can use it to help to help quantify our practices. And we can even write name because I'm because I'm only men's basketball. I'm at every practice as well, so I'm like I can run it live. So I can tell you in lot like in act, in actuality as it's going on live. Hey, we can push a bit harder, or like hey, we need to push a bit harder, or or we're gonna pull these two, these two back, give them some rest and practice and things like that, and then almost like almost like an under promise, over deliver. God, the other coach, it helps build that trust and have those kind of conversations and relationships of like, hey, how do we keep our best players as healthy as possible? Well, and and, and as we all know, availability is the key. Uh, yeah, I mean, and and especially when you're dealing with a sport where there's only 15 people on the team. Yeah. There's going to be a big drop off between your top seven and your bottom seven. Your bottom seven is the bottom seven for a reason. Yeah. They're not as good as the top guys. I mean, once again, as, as Ray said, and, and Herm said it the best, Herm, uh, Coach Edwards said it the best, we play to win the game. I mean, there's not a coach in Division One, and it doesn't matter the sport, that's there for fun, for fun and giggles. Mm -hmm. They're there to win. And their and their job depends on them winning. Now, as you deal with the the more financial, rewarding sports, basketball, football, there's more pressure on those sports than say say your men and women swimming and diving coach, your gymnastic coach, your tennis coach. But as a swimmer, I wanted to win every race and I wanted to win every meet. I mean, once again, you show me a good loser, I'll show you a loser. I mean. Winners win, losers lose. I mean, and that's, you know, I, I don't mean to break it down that simple because I think there's a lot to be learned when you lose. 
And I don't like people to think, you know, it's winning or losing. I always said it's winning or learning, you know, and that, that yeah. comes back from, you know, my years of doing jujitsu. I mean, when I got, when I tapped out, I, I learned, I didn't lose. I mean, we, 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 we slap hands and we punch, uh, punch fists again and we, we go back at it. Um, I, I, I really think what you, what you said with the catapult system and any monitoring system, I think you'll get more benefit out of it with your coach when you tell them, Hey coach, we got to, we got to ramp it up a little bit. Yeah. You know, if you initially go to your coach and say, Hey coach, we got to ramp it down. Your coach is going to look at you and go like, yeah, who's this guy? we're not ramping. We're not ramping yeah. shit down. <laughs> yeah. I think so, I mean, also a lot of it comes from like other conversations. Like, yeah, head coach, and I set out for like two hours. And we were talking about preseasons, like late August before, eight hours started and before 20 hours started and guys are back in town. And I kind of asked them to, I'm like, what, what does a high intensity practice look like for you? And then what does a low intensity practice look like? And what is somewhere in the middle? So that way it forced, like, then he defines it for me and I can fit the things I kind of want to see, like in his, in his boxes of like definitions and understanding. Like, and so now we're, we're on pretty even wavelength of what we just call it non-competitive and competitive practice. So it's like when it's competitive, we know we're going up and down, we're going half court, there's contact, probably do some rebounding drills and work on some pressing. If it's non-contact, there's tons of teaching, non-competitive, um, some walk through stuff, maybe some five on oh, but it's like mostly teaching and more rest. And then when it's competitive, there's little rest and there's a lot of fucking work going on. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it's also the importance of you and the head coach sharing the same language. Yeah, hundred percent. And not only you and the head coach, but the rest of the staff and the athletes understanding that you and the head coach have the same language. So whatever is being said on the court or in the locker room, I'm just going to reiterate it in the weight room. Like, yep. hey, guys, this is a competitive day in the weight room. You know, we're going to jack up. We're going to jack up some weight. We're going after some numbers today because that's what we're doing on the court. Yep, you know, exactly. I think I think where a lot of people make a mistake is. You know, they'll hear like a non-competitive or a low, low impact day on the court. And a lot of coaches will be like, all right, well, then we're going to ramp it up in the weight room. I'm like, all right, so these kids are not getting any day off. No. <laughs> like if you're, if, if, if you're, if your schedule in the weight room isn't compatible with what's going on in the court, the field, the pool, whatever, whatever avenue we're talking about, if it's not compatible with what's going on with the head coach, you're just going to burn that kid out. And you're going to go from the slow burn yep. and the, the slow cook process. And now you, you are microwaving them. And yeah, but at some point, they're going to pop. Well, like TK said, you know, one thing about sport coaches, regardless of sport, I know we're talking about basketball, is one thing that they do understand is player availability. And they understand player availability, um, you know, in terms of their best player or best unit. Because once again, like TK or like you just mentioned, the goal is to win games, right? And you win games with your best players and your best unit. So when you start to have conversations with coaches, you know, I always say you got to hit them where it hurts <laughs> or hit them where it's most effective. And that is being able to have players that are present for practice, right? Because you get better in practice setting, right? And to practice, hopefully you get better for, you know, actual competition. So when you have that conversation with coach in your initial meetings and say, what can we do to keep our players available, feeling good, fresh and healthy, and most specifically that top unit, I think they're more, they're, they're more likely to listen. Okay. And then when you can support that with objective data saying, Hey, this is how things are looking in practice. Here's how things are maybe looking in the weight room, you know, where can we uh, make some adjustments, right? Where can we increase the intensity? Where can we lower the intensity? Where can we increase the volume or lower the volume? So that ultimately we have a fresh player that's available to compete and compete at a high level, right? So it goes back to young coaches again. You guys brought this up. Is when you work with a sport is understanding the culture of that sport understanding the culture and team dynamic of that sport and the situation in which you work with, being able to talk in coaching vernacular, right? 
because to me, that all helps with when you need to communicate this information. Like for instance, you know, whatever sport you work with, you should have an understanding of what, yeah, the physical demands of that sport, the game demands of that sport, but you also have an understanding of traditionally what's the culture of that sport. You know, the culture of men's basketball is different than the culture of women's basketball. Let me tell you, having worked with both sports, it's different than the culture of tennis. I'm sure it's different than the culture of, you know, swimming. So it's like, you know, as a coach, as a practitioner, if you're working with multiple teams, you got to learn how to be a chameleon, right? So yeah. who I am with men's basketball is different than when I'm with women's golf or when I'm with men's golf, right? I got to be able to sort of blend into that culture, understand that sport, and then being able to use uh, certain vernaculars to get a point across to achieve an outcome. And that comes with, like someone mentioned, coaching reps. And, you know, uh, experience, making mistakes, what have you. So, I mean, I just wanted to kind of, you know, you know, put that out there because I think TK's success at UMass right now, this is his first time working with men's basketball, but he's worked with multiple teams prior to coming into that position. But TK also understands basketball because he played basketball. He understands the culture, understands probably the player makeup, what that kind of looks like, and then kind of knows how to speak their language. We were, TK and I were talking about a coach that left the program. Coach TK, you know what I'm about to bring up, right? And, you know, <laughs> oh, feedback yeah, yeah. was coming back from this program about a particular coach. And their thoughts were, you know, this particular coach was pompous. Um, didn't really, could, could, couldn't really relate to the players, you know, quote unquote, was, could be, was a little weird, you know, and, you know, the coach that is in question, very good at what he does. Extremely talented. Am I correct, yeah. TK? Yeah, 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 really good. The last, the last, that, it, was, it was a soft skills bit. A soft skills bit that was the, perception, like that was the perception of this particular coach from, staff and players you see what i'm saying so the question is is with all of the intellect that you have right what's most important is is like how you know with the intellect how, how can you apply it and, and get your you know your players to do what you need for them to do but get your coaches on board at the end so of the day Boston, start uh, so boss, uh, Boston and I, Boston's a women's basketball center. We share an office, and something we've both said to interns literally the last probably three days is they both of them were like, Oh, no, I just want to be in ba just be basketball only. And then we both said, Like, you haven't earned the right to be basketball only yet. Like, like exactly. you need, like, like you, this is your first time ever coaching, and like, we let you coach one warm up or two or three warm ups, but like, just ba a basketball players who like. In Boston's case, he's been in for three years, so they they will trust anybody he puts in front of them because like they're used to him. And it was, with my guys was just starting to get there, but still of like you know it's basketball. Like I have groups of four and five. And so I was like, oh, you need exposure to a tennis, to a men and women's soccer, to a swim and dive, to a lacrosse. I'm like, because they're all going to be different. I'm like, some of the needs are going to be similar from like the true from the training perspective. I was like, but the personality is how you fletch your personality and bend your personality around working with those players, to what, you, what, you, what you say, how you convey the information. If it's a big group, like our lacrosse team works out as one team all together, <laughs> I might have 30, I might, that's 35 people. I'm like, you need to be comfortable being in front of, even not that by yourself, even if it's you, another coach, you need to be comfortable being in front of 30 plus people. Cause it might be a chance, might be a time we have to do that, especially working in college basketball. Like there's a, ch there's a chance you may have to warm up 50 kids that have, at a fucking basketball camp one day in the summer that, that coach asked you to do. And you don't want to be that guy who can't who can't do it. And so and, just getting and, those reps and, and like I, I've told I've told them to get personal training certification so many times. I'm like, just get it because you need reps coaching. The same way people who are comedians get reps, get reps of doing stand up constantly. People who are uh, musicians get tons of reps in performance. Like it's just reps. Like do like do the work and it makes you better in the end. Well, the, the athletes will smell bullshit right out of the yeah. game. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they have a high bullshit meter. 
I mean, yeah. blood, in, it, blood in the water. <laughs> oh, oh, and yeah, it is a free. It will be a feeding frenzy. I mean, I would tell you to get those, get them in front of the men's lacrosse team as soon as possible, because you want to talk about very complete, almost opposite cultures. <laughs> yeah, men's. I mean, the only one that I might go greater would be like women's golf to men's lacrosse. Like that would be ridiculous. But like yeah. when I first got in the profession, I had 20 teams and I just had me. I didn't yeah. have GAs. I didn't have interns. Yeah. So I had to go from men's basketball to men's lacrosse to women's soccer to women's tennis to swimming and diving. And, and like, I think right now, and Ray, we talked about this last week. One of the big issues is that, you know, you get these young coaches in and they, oh, I'm going to do basketball. Pardon my language, yeah. but who the fuck are you? I mean, yeah. you're, you're 23 years old. You're a year older than our, our senior center. I mean, yeah, they don't maybe. Know. maybe. Yeah, maybe. You might be <laughs> no, younger. Yeah. Um, and, and I think where a lot of them, a lot of, and now we're going to get into our profession, a lot of what is going on in our profession, you know, Joe Ken and, and Ray, you touched on it. We've got to be the chameleon in the room. We've got to be the, the most adaptable person in our athletic department. And a lot of these, a lot of these young strength coaches don't have that adaptability to going from team to team, to team, to team, to team, to coach, to coach, to coach, to admin, to sports medicine. They just aren't comfortable with having those tough, tough conversations. Well, I'm going to tell you now, if you don't have those tough conversations early, you're not going to have those conversations later because you're going to be fired. I mean, that's just the reality of it. So if you, you know, be uncomfortable early in your career and get comfortable being uncomfortable so that you have a longer, you have a longevity in this profession, you know, and that's, that's what everybody should wish for. You shouldn't wish that in five years, you're looking for another job. You yeah. should look that you want to be at the whatever whatever organization that you're with. You should want to retire there if possible. Hundred percent. I think a uh, big one that we that as coaches can do that are like older, been in profession, especially if you had interns and GAs, is try your best to work with the sport coaches to see if you can get them in those meetings. And hey, like there's gonna be be a fly on a wall. Like don't you don't have to sit. Don't I don't expect you to say anything. Don't, don't comment talk. on anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, I was like, your job is just to sit and listen. Because like that's even that's a learning factor. I think there are lots of coaches who've been who have been in transition for a long time who don't have those conversations with their sport coaches. Ray and I know plenty of them who don't have. They're like whether it's a fear thing, whether it's a, it's a skill thing. Like either way, but there are a lot of guys who just never do that. So I think even having those like your GA, if you have a GA or interns, be like, hey, like you're gonna you're gonna, you're gonna sit here, just like just watch. We'll talk about it after. And your coaches follow that, like have them sit in those meetings, those big staff meetings, or even one on one, like meetings with just like a sport coach or like your AT. It's like they need to be involved in that process and see that and see how you handle it. And then you can talk, like, oh, okay, here's the things I could have done better in the conversation. Here's the things that worked well. Like, how would you have handled it if you were dealt with that same thing? So they get that exposure early. Because otherwise, you get to a point where you like you go from an intern to a GA to maybe like a head job, so even just a small sport. Like you've never had to be in those conversations. Like you're gonna have to, you, you have to learn really quickly, or you're gonna resort to the mean of just like I'm just not gonna have a conversation. Well, and I and I would tell I would tell the coaches that have the interns and GAs, don't just bring them in there for the good meetings. Yeah, bring, bring them in, for, bring yeah. them in for the hard meetings. Bring them yeah. in for those hard discussions, where there's a strong likelihood that as you being the performance coach, you're gonna get motherfucked a lot. Yeah. And, 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 and they need to see how you deal with that and how you yep. respond to that because we've all been there. We've all been the reason that some sport coaches team hasn't won. I yeah. mean, and, and that, that's really, that's really, I mean, we've this all been fired. This, 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 this drives my last job. <laughs> yeah, but, but, like, but, but that's, okay. and, and then this is where we're going to get, this is probably how we're going to the, probably the meat of the discussion, you know, we've all been fired, you know, and, Part of the problem in the profession is that there's really no quantifiable, quantifiable way to, are we good at our job? Yeah. You know, nobody's really come up with, all right, well, if, I've, if I have a certain standard of tests that the coach and I agree upon, 
these are the tests that we're going to do preseason. Maybe midseason, if you have a coach that's okay with that, you usually won't have a coach that's okay with a midseason test day, but then have them at an end. And if you can show that they've gotten stronger or they've done better from the start to the end on all the tests that you all have come up with, then in my eyes, you've done your job. My eyes as a, a sports performance coach, you've done your job. Now, we know that's not true. <laughs> because at the end of the day, the head coach gets paid to win games. And they're going to go, as you said, TK, the gentleman before you, there was injuries, whatever. There was some availability issues. So if I was overseeing men's basketball at UMass, is there more, were the players more available this year than last year? Then I would say TK did their, TK did his job. You know, we improved on the main thing that TK was brought in here to do. Make sure that the players that need to be available were available. Now, that might not mean that UMass has a winning record and yeah. wins the Atlantic 10 and makes the NCAA tournament. But that's not what TK was brought in here to do. I could be wrong. Yeah. But that's where... I think we all need to have, once again, those discussions with the head coach on what is our responsibility? What are we agreeing upon as my job to do with your athletes? Because at the end of the day, they are their athletes. We're just, we're a spoke in the wheel. You know, no matter. If, if I can jump in on this, this is, yeah. a, this is a conversation that myself, Eric Corm at the time, uh, Kira Wyndham Flat, Scott Kuhn, we were going down this path of trying to identify how do you measure the sport performance role uh, when working with a particular team, okay? And it goes back to, once again, understanding if the objective is to win, what are the boxes that need to be filled in order to achieve the objective? Sometimes we forget that the player is also responsible for achieving the, the objective as well. So, you know, one of those boxes is player lifestyle. You can't tell me that a player's lifestyle outside of the sport doesn't impact sport, right? But here's the thing. When you look at those boxes, what are the things that impact sports readiness and preparation? For me, I will say this, and there's a good book out there, um, The Process 1 and 2, okay, that I've read. You know, when you look at, you know, you know, tactical preparation, tactical preparation, psychological preparation and physical preparation. Right. Those are different buckets at the end of the season, depending on, you know, what your you know, what the outcome was is win or loss. Those the, the staff that includes, you know, assistant coaches, head coaches, sport coaches, ATCs, what have you, you need to sit down and, and assess the year. Right but you have to assess what things that you did well, because what things did you do? Because sometimes we look at wins and losses, but the thing is, if you didn't have a good year, what things that you did well that you can utilize for the upcoming season as a weapon, and then the things that were weaknesses that we can work on in the off season. So you have to have an assessment of your team, then you have to have assessment of individual players, right? So here's the thing, you know, what, are the variables that you're going to assess when it comes to physical preparation? What are the variables you're going to assess when it comes to tactical preparation? What are the variables you're going to assess when it comes to uh, technical and psychological, right? And then you say for each athlete, are they meeting those variables within those buckets, right? Because you can very well find out that coach, you know, whatever metrics you want to kind of uh, measure within the physical preparation bucket, there's no issues there. The limiting factor is probably technical. So now it's the sport coach's job to say, hey, these are some technical limitations and um, some uh, limiting, limiting factors. We probably need to work on these factors in the off season, but also recognize this is this player's strength as well. So how can we utilize that in tactical situations? Right? You understand what I'm saying? Or yep. some players I've worked with, you know, I've worked with a young lady at the University of Wisconsin who has very strong athletic i mean just technically sound her limitation was physical i mean i'm not physical but psychological i think she had a, a, a fear of competing a fear of being put under pressure and that had a hindrance to her sport expression 
So the thing is, we can actually figure out, you know, our individual roles and have a way of measuring, right? But the issue is, it's also the responsibility of the coaches to kind of measure their bucket as well to see where their limitations are. And then put together a list of these are all the our strengths, these are all of our weaknesses and our limitations, and this is what we're going to work on offseason to be a better team. Because one thing I've noticed in college basketball is with inconsistent minute players, this is a time where our starters and our rotation, they're going to get a tons of reps and practices and games. And we're going to focus all of our efforts in that unit in, to, to achieve the task. But the individuals that sort of, you know, get the short end of the stick are your players that are not playing high minutes. Well, you know what? In the competitive season, that's the optimal time to develop physical, technical, tactical, psychological output so that when the season's over and when you go into your off-season set, they are ready to go. But what I've noticed is those players are put to the side. You know what I mean? And then once the season's over, now there's this sense of urgency to get them up to speed. And I'm saying to myself, we just missed five months of preparing those particular athletes who are going to probably play more extensive minutes the following year for sport. So for me, once again, is anytime we look at wins and losses, I think it's unfair. And I'll say that it's unfair to kind of look at one bucket and say that is the limiting factor and that is the problem. Because I've been in this business long enough to know and see that there's some coaches out there, and I'll say it on your podcast, they're not good at their craft. Yep. Period. <laughs> and they need to get better in their craft. They need to get better in their area of expertise, right? To develop an overall, overround athlete. So this is something that, you know, once again, at William Mary with Eric Horn, we were going to venture down that role, uh, that road of at the end of the year, pods coming together assess the season based off whatever daddy data you collected out of the season looking at the area looking at the buckets where you know what player has strengths in each bucket limitations and then that's what we work on in the off season because sometimes in the off season you have players that don't work on their weaknesses right go to any basketball uh practice right and you have a post player right um you know Working on dunking. Taking, taking, taking three point, taking three point <laughs> shots. Like, you know, it's, so it's like, you know, you know, what is, you know, as a post player, what's the task you need to, under, to, to, to understand technically and tactically? What does that player need to learn in your system? And let's, and, you know, and then what do, and how do we achieve that, you know, during the off season so that when the, when the season comes around, we are ready to go. There's so many variables that impact sport wins and losses. And, and, you know, the environment, I, I'm, I'm in William and Mary right now in Virginia. It's beautiful outside. And I used to you're work also, as well. But and you're also work. looking like at, at William and Mary, your academic standards are a little different that are at UMass. That's, that's, sorry, that's, that's, sorry, that's, sorry, TK. I mean, no, I mean so, those so, are, that's just so facts. You, These are just yeah. facts here. I mean. Uh, <laughs> so, even, so even the recruiting is a challenging, it's a challenge for us because of the academic standards that's required from the students that, come to William Mary, right? Um, so we're getting the best intellectually, right? But we may not, may not be getting the best when it comes to, you know, uh, athletically, having to go up against conference mates that, you know what, they probably don't have such a limitation and we're going up against like workhorses. You, you see what I'm saying? So even at William Mary, and we've discussed this here is given the type of athletes that we get and God bless them, we love them. Like, you know, our approach to development to readiness may be a little bit different than at Northeastern or at a UMass. That's, that's part of the University of Delaware. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a question for all three of you. Okay. Sure. We've brought this subject up before. The industry's got to change, right? Your profession's got to change. It has to. I, everything that anyone's come on this podcast and said about it, I agree with 100% being a former athlete. I, I can see the issues. Mm -hmm. I can see how what you're suggesting is going to help teams, help athletes. So how does it change? Is, it, is there something <laughs> that can be done immediately or is it just something that is gonna happen over time, just doing, re, being on resources like this and just getting the general idea out there and, and, and over time it changes. So what, how does it change? TK, you go first. <laughs> I think 
I think a big piece of it for the change, I think you need more people trying to do like what like a Bob Alejo is doing at Cal State Northridge, getting to those real listen like decision maker positions. But to have but to do that, you also need there are people who think that way who get out of the profession too soon. So I think you need some people who are willing to do what an Alejo did and be in a profession for what is probably going 30 years coaching now, if not longer. Um, and so I think you need people who are willing to kind of grow, kind of go through this shit for a while and deal with and have those hard conversations, be fired, hired, or whatever. Be willing to leave a job and then go back to uh, to get those missions of like associate AD or assistant AD that have actual responsibility. Because you see some of the where people who have like associate AD titles, but they're really just like the football strength coach or like the basketball strength coach. So I think you need need that, and so you need people willing to kind of go through the graft for a while and stuff for a bit and get to those positions. I think that's how the only way it changes. But unfortunately, I think we see, we're currently seeing a trend of like too many people who are really smart getting out of their profession really early. Coach Ray, how does it change in your opinion? You know, I'm going to piggyback off TK. I mean, once again, I've seen the benefit of such an environment where you had someone that understood uh, sport, understood physical preparation, uh, being in position, um, where they were reporting to the athletic director and they oversaw sports medicine, uh, sports performance, sports nutrition, what have you, and were able, and, and here's the thing, this person not only didn't have, this person not only didn't have the, uh, this person had the savvy, the science savviness, but also understood the art of coaching, was able to mirror the two and pretty much, you know, create such a culture but I agree with TK. Unfortunately, some of the strength coaches that I've known who were really good at their craft, really good on the floor, understood the art of coaching and the science of coaching and knew how to kind of merge the two. Those uh, practitioners are just getting out of the game because of just being frustrated, you know? And now we're left with a core of individuals that, you know, are left with, you know, trying to take up that task. So, you know, there's people out there, I guess, smarter than me, like, like Coach Aleo, who kind of, you know, he speaks about this all the time on Twitter that can dive more into what is needed. But like TK was saying, we need people um, like ourselves that understand coaching has been in the trenches and uh, positions of decision making. Coach Spellman, how's it change? Uh, I hate to piggyback on these on these gentlemen, but I mean, I think he's right on the they're, they're right on the right on point. The other thing I would say is that our governing bodies need to do a better job for uh, promoting our profession and raising the standards, not only for, you know, uh, a quality of life so we can stay in the profession longer, but also mm -hmm. how we are compensated and how we are treated as a whole. Uh, right now we have two uh, governing bodies. So I think we need to get back to a, a, a system where there's one governing body and it's not the old guard that's uh, the board of directors, but they have younger individuals that want to be uh, in a leadership uh, position. You know, I think one of the great things that the CSCCA did this past year was that, you know, they, they got a new uh, CEO um, nothing against, you know, the gentleman that uh, put it together, uh, Doc Sturgeons, I believe. But you know, some of the old blood needs to needs to move aside for some of the younger blood, and to have a full representation of the people in this profession, uh, where you have Dr. Pat Ivy and Corliss Fingers on the board of directors for the CSCCA, and it just doesn't look like a vanilla freaking pamphlet of white males being at the head of the uh, board of directors for any of the organizational bodies. But I think it's also up, us to, uh, up to us to have these conversations that we're having today and demand better from the, from the people that we work with. I mean, if you get it on Indeed today, you'll see full-time jobs, bachelor's required, master's preferred. You're gonna work with four sports. They say you're only gonna work 40 hours a week. Guys, I won't even ask you how many hours you work a week because if you're only working 40 hours, you're done by Wednesday and you get a four-day week <laughs> off Thursday through Sunday. 
So 40 hours a week, go to hell, but now compensate me for the hours that I'm working. I'm not, I'm not asking. I mean, if you want to pay me over a hundred grand, I'll take it, but don't pay me $35,000 yeah. when, when I'm being required to have a master's, I need two to three years experience in the field. And I'm working with one of the, the top two programs at your university. Compensate me like, compensate me like you're going to compensate the head coach because there's not a head coach in basketball or football that does not say this. My number one hire was my strength and conditioning coach. Oh, there's yeah, not one that says. Yeah, and that's, that's, and that's an, and I think too is like when, especially when those like high revenue sports, like, like if you're in the basketball, the football, baseball, if you're in the SEC, wrestling, if you're in like the Big Ten, um, is that you're attached to those coaches. So those, that staff is not successful, it's fired. You also have a job. Yep. So it's like, it's like if you're being, being out of, you know, if you're, if you're a sport coach or if you're like a head coach, and you're out of a job that was paying you $800,000 a year. That's not like, that's not as bad as another year on a contract as opposed to if you're the strength coach, you have a job that was paying you 40. It's like, you're struggling. <laughs> like, yeah. But, but, but you're struggling and you are attached to a head coach. You want to attach to a, you want to attach to a, 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 a wider spectrum. So yeah. like, especially for the young coaches, you, you've painted yourself into a corner. I only want to do basketball. I only want to do football. Hey, maybe the, being the director of Olympic sports at a big, a big five school might, might be a little nicer job, might not pay as much, might not have the same exposure, but guess what? You got job security. So I, I think there's a lot of things that need to, I mean, uh, we've, we've all talked about this. There's a lot of things that need to, need to change and it's going to take people like ourselves to de- to not only work for that change but to demand it because Understood. as we know our profession is oversaturated right now and you have a lot of qualified individuals me included <laughs> who you know like uh, there's a director of uh sports performance out at long beach state it's open. I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't really care what happens, but why am I going to move cross country with my family? If you're going to pay me $60,000 a year in a state that you can't live on $60,000 a year. Because you're going to be closer to me. You're going to be closer to me. That's why. (laughs) But, 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 but I think, I think that's where a lot of young coaches they're getting out because they don't understand where you gentlemen are, where I've been. It took me, 15 years to get there and just like that i got fired so it's one of those things that we do need to demand a place at the table like bob alejo like dr ivy that they have those positions where we're overseeing the whole performance team because when you get to the level that we're at we can have those intelligent conversations with all those different silos and bring them together as one. So leadership. Yep. Final question. Let's make it a little more lighthearted. All right. <laughs> Since I got three basketball strength coaches here, this is something, this is a statement that was brought to me probably 15, 20 years ago. It's been in my head and it's got to be ironed out. You cannot defense Marcus Camby. Yeah, I, I couldn't. I didn't care. <laughs> couldn't defend Marcus Gibb. Yeah. Earlier, before when uh, TK got on, I, uh, you know, when I saw UMass, the first thing that came to mind was that when I was a freshman in high school, our first uh, uh, scrimmage was against Harvard Public, and I got thrown in to, to guard Marcus Camby. 6'4 versus 6'11, 14 versus 18. <laughs> 14 versus fun. grown ass man. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, a friend or a colleague one time brought this to my attention and I, and I, I want to iron this out. He said, there's a, there's a big difference between division one basketball players and division two basketball players. <laughs> division two basketball players are actually bigger and stronger. They have more mass and they're stronger, but division one players are faster and leaner. And that's why that, avatar of an athlete is more successful what do we think mm, as, as, <laughs> as, as a as a former d2 i will say i don't know about i don't know about bigger our our tallest player was six 
seven and shoes. Yeah, I don't think tall. I think I think Mass. I <laughs> oh, think Mass. Oh. Yeah, I think Mass is what he's talking. Yeah, I could see. I could. I could. Stronger part. I could. I could definitely see that on the strongest. On the stronger part, Mass wise. Hmm. I don't know. I could definitely see stronger though. I could definitely see. It's just like here for the Division Two basketball play. Even like like myself, it's like you're not you're not as athletic as a Division One guy. So you gotta try to build on what you can, what you have. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's a hard question for me to to answer because in in in, in typical uh, strength coach fashion, I don't have the data <laughs> to support. <laughs> Well, that, can, that's good. That's actually the right answer. I didn't because I didn't know that there was statistics out there that supported that. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I can, I, 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 we I, have I, we have one DT transfer. Like, like he's he's built he's built like a like an NFL D end. <laughs> but he was at JMU for two years and then uh, Southern Connecticut for a year, and now he's here. A grad grad student transfer. So he and then I have a lot of other guys who've been been at UMass or other Division One schools that transfer who are all like really skinny. Most of them. So that'd be something. I mean, that's anecdotal, so that's just one place. But <laughs> Mark, what do you feel about that? I, I think the biggest difference between D one, D two, D three is just ability. Exactly. You know, I, mean, I, I just, I just think. I mean, the main difference is that they're better at their sport. Hmm. I mean, when I had when I had my kids at Fairfield, I was like, listen, there's a reason you're here. You're not good enough to play at Duke in North Carolina. I mean, you're just not good enough. And hmm. I, I might have been the first coach to tell these kids that they weren't good. And they're like, what do you mean I'm not oh, good? I'm here right. on a full ride. You're good for here. Yeah. But okay, remember, if you're 4'11", you're the tallest midget. <laughs> I mean, but you're still a midget. <laughs> I mean, and I, I'm, not try, I'm not trying to upset anybody about this, but being the tallest midget is not gonna make you six fucking six. I mean, <laughs> there's a reason you're at Fairfield. Coach K, and uh, Coach Williams and Coach Self, none of them missed you on the recruiting trip. That's just reality. You're at Fairfield because our coaches saw you and you had a good game and nobody else gave you an offer. Awesome. Exactly. Coach Ray, where can people uh, get a hold of you, see you on socials, that type of thing? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have to get ready for practice. You <laughs> yes, can, I'm, I've been on Instagram a lot lately, so I, my Instagram account is at – Edie Ray. Yep. Awesome. Yes. Coach yes, TK, how about you? Uh, let's see. Twitter is <laughs> TK Fizz Prep. And then Instagram is T Kennel Fizz Prep. One of the ones other strangers in town is physical preparation coach. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you guys for your time today. This has been uh, a great conversation with you too. And, guys, and, we're gonna, and we we're, weren't we're, stepping out, stepping on each other like I thought we were going to do. So this <laughs> four, four person conversation might work, Mark. Thank you. We're going to have you guys back on because we really, we really have a lot more stuff that we got to dive a little deeper into. So I appreciate you guys taking, taking the uh, time out of your busy schedules, sitting down, talking with us. And I hope you gentlemen have a great year this year. Thank unless you. TK, unless TK, I'm the director of strength and conditioning at GW. And then you and I will just go out for dinner when you come down to Washington. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. Awesome. We are the Athlete Hackers. Check us out on uh, Google, Apple, Spotify. Spotify. <laughs> you are. I'm Chris Trade. And I am Mark Spelling. We are the Athlete Hackers. All my best. God bless. And peace. Peace.